And welcome everyone. Today is Wednesday, August 15th, and this is the Aperio Teaching and Learning Call. Uh, my name is Tricia Gordon. I'm at the University of Virginia, and I'm delighted to welcome you and our speaker today, Michael Friesen. Um, but before we begin, I wanted to check in and first of all, ask everyone to click on the Etherpad link there and sign in. So we have our attendees. And um, also, I would like to request, if you're not speaking, if you could mute your mic. Um, that would be really helpful. So with that, I'd like to invite anyone who has announcements to come on the mic and fill us in. Hi, this is Wilma. Um, I've actually got a few announcements. So. Great. Um, first one is that the virtual conference um, call for proposals is open. So if you have a topic that you'd like to share, um, I'm going to paste the link here in the big blue button chat. Um, go ahead and get those proposals in. They'll be open until, um, I believe, September 21st. And um, we're really encouraging people to do kind of brief little lightning talks showcasing their courses. Um, that's a question we get from people a lot is, you know, how are other people setting this up? So even if you think it's nothing special, other people might be inspired by what you're doing. So if you know of anybody on campus um, that has a really nice uh, designed site, that you might encourage them to submit a proposal. Um, but anyway, get those in. And the, um, the virtual conference is actually going to be in November. Um, it's November 7th. That's a Wednesday. So, um, so that's the date for the actual event. And it should be a lot of fun. Um, if you've attended in previous years, it's usually uh, quite the energetic affair. So, <laughs> so hopefully um, you'll submit and attend. Um, another upcoming event that we have is uh, Sakai Camp. That is coming up in January, but we're planning now. It's actually in Orlando, and I'm going to paste the um, link to the registration form for that. The registration for Sakai Camp is free. We don't charge a registration. All you have to do is kind of get yourself there. <laughs> so whether that's plane, train, or automobile, um, get down to Orlando and pay for your room. But the um, the conference itself, is, there's no fee. And we usually do a lot of fun events around it. But it, it tends to be a small group of about 20 to 30 folks um, that sort of uh, you know talk about Sakai, um, talk about roadmap, um, maybe in topics of interest. It's, it's an unconference, so the agenda is typically set by the attendees. Um, so it's a very interactive uh, workshop meeting type um, event, so I encourage you, if, you've, if you're interested, um, please do think about uh, coming to see us all in Orlando in January. And then two last announcements. The first one is code freeze. Um, we do have the um, the code freeze for 19 is coming up. That's going to be at the end of this month, August 31st. So if um, you yourself are a developer and you're working on any features, or if there are people at your institution that are looking to contribute code that you want to make it into the 19 release, you need to get those co code contributions in by the 31st so that they can be included uh, in the upcoming release. And right now we're targeting uh, late November, like around Thanksgiving U.S. time uh, for the release. So that's the, the target right now. But um, right now the first deadline is the code freeze, and so that's coming up at the end of this month. And I think that's it. Those are all my announcements. Wonderful. Thank you. Does anybody else have any announcements? Okay, we had a request, a couple of requests to um, review a couple of JIRAs, and let me paste in the first one and invite you all to go take a look at this page. Uh, let's see, it is about the sign up tool. And I'm not sure if it was Adrian. So, Okay, so Matt Jones asked if, if we could talk about this on a teaching and learning call. It's changing 
the export from sign up to be split one row per participant rather than everyone grouped. And uh, Wilma, do you know more about this? Um, not really. I mean, all that I know is what's in the JIRA. I know that um, Adrian had forwarded me this JIRA and asked if we could add it to the okay. agenda. But I think they just wanted feedback from folks okay. on whether or not we liked the change, if that was okay. something that was going to be um, good to have for everybody or if it needed to be an option where you could have it formatted a couple different ways depending on whether or not you select a, a particular option. Okay, great. Um, then uh, I invite all of you on the call to comment if you do um, care about this feature and, and want to give input. So the URL is right there. And then Alan Regan wanted to discuss the forum stats. And I think there is a consensus already on what the behavior ought to be, but um, that's the JIRA in the chat there. You want to click on that and take a quick look. So there's some discrepancies in the way the forums calculates red red forums and uh, replies, et cetera. So if this is something that you want to provide input on, you can um, read the JIRA, follow the comments. Since Alan's not on the call today, um, I'll just invite everybody to um, take a look and see if there are any concerns or um, votes if you want to vote for this um, proposed change, then uh, I would log in to JIRA and do that. Okay. So we are ready to invite our speaker, Michael Friesen, from University of Western Ontario to deliver his presentation, his Atlas Award-winning presentation on online learning um, safely and socially with Sakai. So, Michael, I'm ready to turn it over to you. Hi, Ms. Gore. Thanks, Trish. Uh, Trisha? Uh, Trisha, sorry. Um, and, and, and hi to those of you who I was very fortunate enough to meet at Aperio, and apologies to those whose names I have not placed with the faces that I met. Um, so, and thank you also for inviting me. It's, it's absolutely lovely to be here. Um, I, am, um, I am deeply honored. Uh, so let's, let's, let's get into this. Um, let's see if this is going to work for me. Let's see, there we go. Is that coming up full screen for people? Yes, it is. Okay, very good. So um, this is, um, this is the this is more or less what I delivered back in June in Montreal. Uh, I have made one, I have added one slide and taken out two um, because things change and and we learn. Um, so for much of my career, and for those of you who actually were at the session in Montreal, I, I apologize. Most of this is going to be what you've already heard. So maybe you can pull up a uh, pull up Tetris or the news. Uh, <laughs> And um, so for much of my career, I've worked as a provider of instructional technology services. Um, I've been the, the person between the, the faculty and the technology. Um, and in this case, in this context, though, um, I'm representing faculty. Um, now, back when I was working in the intermediary role, I did study that uh, extensively to the point where I got to add, add a D to the name and lose the M, which was kind of fun. Um, so what I'm addressing today is how we can use, um, how I have been using the Sakai LMS to uh, provide a social learning experience for students without compromising their privacy uh, and without allowing uh, commercial interests to uh, invade the classroom any more than necessary. And perhaps one of the ironies about this is the, the nature of the course that I'm teaching, the subject matter of the course. So here's what I've got planned. Um, this is my, my Twitter handle, uh, and coming up, I'm going to introduce myself very briefly because I think it might be helpful to understand um, how 
um, how the ingredients that went into the way that I constructed my course and the way that I look at online learning and social learning. I'm going to discuss the course uh, for a little bit. Uh, I'm going to address the questions of why would I bother teaching in the way that I teach in an online course. Uh, and mostly, I'm going to be discussing the tools that I use, how I use them, and how students respond to those tools. Afterwards, I hope that we have time for some follow-up, um, some questions, uh, comments, and uh, any insights that you can offer to me are, are going to be most welcome. All right, so, and then let's see what we've got next. What's my next slide? Oh, there we go. So uh, this is sort of a recipe here. Um, this, is, this, is not a, uh, this is not a reference to the, um, the classic science fiction movie To Serve Man. It turns out To Serve Man is actually the title of a cookbook rather than a uh, manifesto. So um, here's, here's how I was cooked. Um, I started with classroom teaching, and uh, I did that all around the world, and I moved on to um, getting certifications in a variety of technologies. So I had both the academic as well as the, the tech background, at least to some degree. Uh, in terms of the subject matter, well, I teach a course on social media, so uh, having had experience in the media for 30-odd years, uh, 20 or 30 years, I guess, helped a great deal. And finally, naturally, I drifted into the concepts of user experience and information design, which led to a couple of trademarks and a patent. So all of these factors uh, contribute to the way that I approach the task of teaching. Uh, it's not just the content, it's also how we present the content and being able to understand the technologies that sit behind the content. All right. So back in 2013, a few years ago now, I was invited to teach a course on social media and organizations. That is to say, how businesses and organizations can use social media to accomplish what they want to accomplish. Let's see. I'm not getting a screen update here. Let's see. Hello. No, I'm not updating my screen at all. That's interesting. Oh. <laughs> well, of all the times for this to happen, that's, that's interesting yeah. and remarkable. Let's see if that works. No, that's not working. Let's yeah. see if we do this. Let's, let's force Kino to quit. All right. Let's cancel that. We are entirely locked. That's amazing. Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, uh, step two. Let's. <laughs> I can either restart that or I can just go to the paper version. Let's see. Let's, let's just do the paper version. Let's do the paper version. Yeah. Let's do the paper version. Let me skip to that. And we'll go full screen on that. You, uh, where's my full screen? There we go, enter full screen. There we go. There we go. No, that's it. Okay. There we go. All right. So, there we go. So, my course is social media and organizations. Uh, I should teach a course on how to recover from unexpected technical glitches. Um, so, how business and governments and other organizations. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this, this is the course uh, on social media, and coming into the course, I know that my students are going to have some study skills. They are third and fourth year university students. Um, knowing your audience, I think, is a, going to be a terribly useful thing in terms of um, developing and delivering an online course. I know that my students have the ability to write reasonably well. Sorry, is that coming up for everybody? Yeah, it looks great. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, and I know that my students, not surprisingly, most of them are basically familiar with social media. Uh, every few semesters, I'll get one or two students who either do not use it at all or they are reluctant users, which is interesting. It doesn't invalidate their work. It does, In fact, in many cases, it makes them more, um, more nuanced thinkers about social media. 
but these are the advantages that I have coming into the, the process. So the content about, of the course is how to think about social media in an organizational context. But fortunately, I don't really have to worry about that in this context of what I'm talking about today. Today, more I'm looking at the mechanisms that I use in delivering this material, which is to say that I want to provide a learning ex environment that is as interactive as I can make it, and I will specifically want to do it using in-course tools. And the reason, of course, is those of us here who are, I mean, I think everybody here is nominally technical or more, te I, I know actually from having met you that most of you are more technical than I am. Um, but we know that everything is visible. Everything you do on a network is visible and everything is being watched, pretty much. Uh, I feel that my classroom should not be a commercial space. My students, I, I'm not delivering uh, something that has to be funded by advertisements. At least I hope I'm not. I know that students pay to attend the university, but I prefer to keep my, my activities outside of that space, outside of the, the concept of commercialization. Now, my students do write public blogs. I make them do that. They, they are students in a faculty of journalism. So they have to be accustomed to the notion that some of the things that they do are visible. But nothing else is public. Um, we don't, I don't allow any other uh, public intrusion into my room. I feel that students should be free to express their ideas without having to worry about the, uh, the possibility of censure. If they want to go to strange and unexpected places, that's great. But we know that social media, uh, public speech tends to be inherently constrained. Although you wouldn't always know that when you look at some of the leaders that we have. Um, I also feel very strongly that our activities and ideas that we express in the classroom shouldn't be monetized. My classroom time is not for sale. Uh, I've sold my time to the university, which then sells it on to the students, and that should be about the limit of it. I don't do product placement in my courses, <laughs> although I'm sure that would be an interesting process. But basically, it's a private party. Uh, I feel strongly that this is not something that should be done in public. So every semester, I do two, at least two quizzes for my students, ungraded, but certainly read, uh, quizzes that I read. Um, the opening one, one of the questions that I ask is, what do you hate most about online courses? And at the end, I do a follow-up with students and I say, well, how did this course rate in terms of your perception of online learning? And we'll get to the, the feedback in a few moments. Uh, but first, I'd like to talk about why we hate online courses. Now, before I do anything else, I should point out that because of the way I'm presenting this, I don't see any comments. So if, if you're commenting, uh, if you have questions, please break in at any time. Uh, just speak up, please. Will do, Michael. I'll Thank you. you Thank you so much for that, Tricia. So why do we hate online courses? Because typically my students tell me there are limited modalities for learning, and they don't always use that language. Usually they'll say, well, the teacher makes us do a reading, and then we have to post to the forum. And that's the extent of the online experience. Uh, I understand that. Online takes a lot of time to create. Uh, but at the same time, it does limit your students to the modalities that you've chosen. Students also don't like the fact that, limit, that assessment tools are limited. We know that... Um, I, I know... <laughs> I've, I've actually been working on a... Um, on speeding up the code to write a table type question where you fill in a table with information. It's not dreadfully code heavy, but it is cumbersome. And it was bad enough that I actually sat down and wrote a, a, a Python script to speed that up for, for myself. Uh, but the modalities for assessment typically are limited. Uh, I'm sure that we've all seen online courses where the only modality is a multiple choice question. Students also don't like the idea that there is a lack of spontaneity and informality. 
Um, obviously, if I'm if I'm spending 20, 40, or 60 hours of work to generate one hour of consumable content, uh, I'm going to want that content to stretch as far as I can, which unfortunately means it tends to be extraordinarily scripted, it tends to be uh, extraordinarily neutral, and reacting to ad hoc events tends to be incredibly difficult because that would mean having to insert more content into the course or removing content uh, from an asset. But the result is that um, online learning tends to have a lack of spontaneity. So there the ad there's the ad hoc again, um, checking in with students, having milestones, uh, letting them know this is where you should be. One of the funny things that I've discovered in, as I look more and more, not at just teaching online, but how we, you know, do a, sort of doing a meta view of it. Um, the more I do this, the more I realize that the concept of UX, user experience, is really one that teachers should be considering when they are developing online learning. Um, it is much harder to detect a student who is losing interest in the course. In a classroom, I can look at what's happening. I can look at it. I can read a student's body language. Uh, if a student simply doesn't come to class, I can detect that. Online, it's much harder to do that. And in fact, yesterday, I was in a conversation with a uh, young lady in the Netherlands who is working on increasing motivation in her students. And we, we experienced, we, we talked about this, and I'll get back to her in a few moments as well. So basically, one of the, the problems that we have is there's a lack of interaction between the students and the professor. Amazingly enough, we're doing online learning and interactivity is a problem. There are reasons for that, and we'll talk about that too. So here's, here are some basic ideas on how I started to look at overcoming the inherent uh, shortcomings of online instruction. Here we go, we're back to UX again. I provide my students with a clarity of sequence and structure. When I start talking about some of the actual tools that I use in my course, um, I'll, I'll deal with specific, um, specific examples of this. I provide multiple avenues for students to engage with the content, although that is actually one of the harder things to do for me. Um, whoops, there we go. Funny, there's an app about that that uh, gets, gets rid of those uh, notifications. Um, I provide students with multiple means for students uh, to engage with each other and the professor. Giving them multiple uh, avenues for engagement is really important. I provide multiple modalities for academic expression. So a student that happens to be not terribly good at um, writing papers can uh, excel in the course or at least survive in the course using, uh, by participating and submitting content in other ways. And essentially, I use many tools. I use a plethora of tools, and this helps to keep the students more interested in the course by giving them a greater variety of exper academic experiences within the context of a single course. Now, yesterday, I mentioned uh, that uh, yesterday I was speaking with a lady, young lady in the Netherlands. And uh, by the way, young lady means anybody who's more than 10 years younger than I am. So young lady could be anywhere from, you know, up to 40 or 45. So just letting you know. Um, so she was, she was telling me that they have 500 students in an online course. This is an organization, and they do online training uh, for people who use their product or their approach. Um, and she was talking about how getting them to stay in the course was difficult. And we talked about the concept of a cohort. Uh, so let's take a look at that. I want to talk about Anne, for example. Anne is a student in a typical e-learning course, perhaps even in my course. So here's Anne. There's Anne. Hi, Anne. And Anne exchanges messages with me. So she's joined the course. She's read the syllabus. She's, uh, she's begun to uh, interact with me. She also reads uh, blog posts or forums, forum con contributions by Carol, Faye, and Dave. Um, she occasionally has a chat with me over Collaborate, uh, because I force my students to do this. Uh, 
she reads Dave's uh, wiki contributions, and she also sees wiki contributions from Bill and Eve. In Anne's view, this is the course. Now, there are other people there, um, but she doesn't really see them. I, on the other hand, I see 30 people, I see 26 people in my course. We're a group. From Anne's perspective, the course has six people in it, and I'm one of them. I saw, uh, sorry, seven people. She's one, six students, and the teacher, and she occasionally interacts with, each, with the other students. I see the entire lot of them. So there's this disjuncture between my view of the concept of a cohort, or my view of the cohort, and any individual student's view of the cohort. How do we get a cohort happening in an online course which is asymmetrical? Uh, I haven't cracked that fully yet, but I'm working on it. I think it's an important thing to do. Uh, and it was an important realization, I think, for me to, to experience yesterday, this, this concept of asymmetry in the perspectives of how big the student body actually is and how the interactions, how many interactions there are, or how few interactions there are. So I'd like to talk, I'd like to get to the tools. Um, we at the Western, we use OWL. I'm going to put it up there. And let's see, what's that tool? Somebody? Nobody? Okay, that's, that's the overview. Um, Name, name that tool according to the icons. Does every edition of Sakai use the same icons, by the way? As far as I know, they do, unless the local institution chooses to change them. Right. Okay. So, so, so it's a valid quiz then. Good. This is, uh, this, this is the overview tool. This is one of those under-loved tools, I suspect. Um, I originally had almost nothing in the overview tool, and over the course of the first two or three or four iterations of my course, um, I've, I've, I've increased my use of the overview tool. It has become an essential UX tool, a com com UX component for me, in the sense that the overview is my student's first entrance into the course. It's, the, it's where I get to tell them this is where the tools are, this is how we do things, this is what I recommend you do. Here are your next steps. Here are things I want you to remember on your journey, but here are your next steps so that students understand what happens next. As teachers, we know this. We have the whole map. We have the whole, we have the whole plot of the film. Um, but I think oftentimes we forget that our students have a limited, our students don't share our understanding of what's happening and what the sequence is. So the overview for me is, a, is an incredibly useful, useful tool. Here we go. Anybody? All right. And there you go. Thank you. That's an announcement. Yes. Maybe this is too easy. Maybe this is too embarrassingly easy. I'm sorry if that's the case. Uh, yeah, those are announcements. I love announcements. I treat announcements like the first five minutes and the last five minutes of a regular classroom. Um, the content that I have in my course has to be, I, I can't change it on a week by week basis. Some components I certainly do. I mean, I'm teaching about social media and the, the rate of change in this field is, is blistering. Uh, things that didn't really exist four years ago are now uh, complete, are now, are now com compromising five and 10% of my course material because things like influencers have emerged. Um, Cambridge Analytica, that happened. Uh, so, so there's a constant need for me to refresh content. But in terms of uh, quick, in, in terms of making um, quick informal announcements, um, the announcements tool is absolutely brilliant. It also allows me to act in a less formal context. So it becomes an informal reminder to students a check-in and an encouragement to them. Next up, lessons. Oops, lessons? missed that one. That was a lesson. That was the lesson tool. Sorry, I've got I've got the next one up. So you, you can also look. You can look up the next one while I'm talking about lessons. Um, yes, I, I use lessons. Uh, they are one of the least social tools that I have, um, but they do con they do contribute to the UX 
aspect of it. Uh, in terms of the way that I structure the lessons uh, is helpful to the students in terms of seeing the progression. Okay, our next tool. What's that one? Chat or forums. Those are forums. Yep, excellent. Um, forums are good. I think forums tend to be overused in classes, uh, not, not invariably, but my experience is that most of my students talk about um, the, the prevalence of forums. Um, so the forums tool, this is a place where students can interact with each other. As a teacher, all that I do on the forums is I post a prompt, I post a barb, and I allow the students, I encourage the students to go at it. And I invite them to interact with each other. I rarely come in on the forums. I rarely come in on those. Uh, and one of the hardest things for me to do as a teacher is to let go. Um, to simply let the students um, interact with each other without my interference. All right, so that's the first four. Next up. Uh, Wilma, we, Wilma, we talked about this one. This is one of the ones that, uh, that we talked about in terms of uh, uh, you had a session where you're splitting up the room. They just replied in the chat that it's assignment. Nope, don't think so. Not, a, not an owl owl, sorry. Oh. <laughs> sorry, in owl owl, that's the wiki. And I know that this is not a beloved tool. Uh, I happen to like it a lot. And the more I use it, the more, the more my students engage with it, the more I... Now, okay, let me rephrase that. I love the idea of wikis. The OWL wiki, not so much. Um, it's not the worst that I've used, uh, but what I love about it is that it's still within the context of our OWL site. I don't send students out anywhere else to work on a wiki. Uh, they're doing it within the context of our OWL site. And it's good practice for them to have to learn how to deal with one because most students have used a wiki at one point or another. I seem to remember there's a rather popular one out there. Um, so wikis, yeah, they're a great tool. They involve, they, they, in, uh, they're an implementation of collaborative development of content, collaborative knowledge development. Um, it, uh, what I do is I actually have two wikis that I always run. One of them is a collection of news stories and uh, that relate to social media and organizations. And the other wiki that I have is for uh, terms related to our uh, field of study. So, and I force the students every semester, I clean it out, every get a set of students gets to rebuild that wiki, uh, gets to rebuild those wikis themselves. They don't get to use the, the material that other students in previous classes have done. Um, so they have ownership of it. Hey, they're a cohort now. They're contributing. They're actually reading what other students have written. They're, uh, I, for, I ask the students to acknowledge what they've written by posting their initials after a contribution. Um, so I'm trying to build this sense of togetherness at the same time that I'm doing something uh, pedagogically effective. OK, what we got here? Yes, and quizzes? Uh, I think that's the polls tool. Ah, statistics. <laughs> Stat, yeah, this one. Uh, okay, yeah. In, in terms, in, in terms of tools, I love polls is really, really low in terms of using it uh, for a lot of reasons. And in fact, I have a second tool that I use that I'm going to talk about in a few moments here. Um, the, the polls tool, for the life of me. Uh, I spent an entire afternoon, and I don't know if Sean, Sean was around to hear my, my screams on this one, but um, I cannot actually figure out what logic the polls tool uses when it publishes the, the, the options that's, that, that participants can check or choose. Um, it, there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason to it. It's not alphabetical. It's not the date. It's not the sequence in which you created them. I, and in fact, from one publishing to another, I'm not even sure it's consistent. So the idea of having a sequence of responses in a poll, um, if you actually insist on the, a specific sequence, you're crap out of luck on polls. However, I do like it because it is a collaborative tool with my students. Um, what I do is every semester, I use polls for 
relatively enjoyable things or for things where I just need to get a, a quick sense of feedback from the students. So for example, uh, I asked the students in the, pa in, in the past, I asked them, uh, what, uh, when will the number of dead people on Facebook exceed the number of living people on Facebook? Does anybody know this one? No. By 2050, there will be more dead people on Facebook than living people. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so silly, silly little poll, silly little question. I mean, yes, this actually has relevance in the sense that later on students get to, to talk about this, this number. They get to talk about this realization when they talk about uh, demographics of social media sites. So it's not all fun and games. But uh, this, I, I do enjoy using the polls tool because they get to participate. Everybody loves doing polls. Um, everybody loves doing questionnaires and then seeing how other people respond. So it's another thing that students can do to be together. Uh, what's up here? I, we were just talking about that. I'm going to call that the calendar tool. I believe that's the sign up. I, uh, I believe in our system, that's the sign up. Uh, I, and the sign up tool facilitates, um, facilitates social behavior. Uh, I love the sign up tool. It is, is a lovely, lovely thing to, before we implemented it, I had to create a wiki with time slots and students would write their names into time slots. So this sign up tool is a godsend and I'm so thankful for it. Um, so the sign up tool, they get to sign up for things and sometimes they sign up for things together. Uh, which is a cool thing again. Here we go. This is. I'm going to stop guessing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I, I thank you for your guesses. This is this is messages and uh, uh, messages is a lovely tool which not nearly enough of my students use and most of them don't use it um, emphatically enough that I can keep within the OWL platform. I like the idea of it. I'd like to use it more often, but uh, email is the primary mechanism that I use. I have to check that little box that says copy to the participant's email address. Um, I would like to use messages more because again, it keeps everything within a commercial free environment, uh, an environment that is not being, to my knowledge at least, is not being monitored and monetized. Um, we recently moved to Exchange, th um, to Exchange uh, Office 365, uh, which means that we are now, um, yeah, so which is why I like to use messages. All right, I have two more tools, and these are not within the OWL context. These are external. This one, uh, we do use Collaborate at this time. Uh, it's a good tool, and Collaborate allows us to work uh, in real time, um, collaboratively. I wonder why they named it that way. So um, yes, there are things I really dislike about it. I think the setup tool is is appalling. Um, but that's that's no, that's not an owl issue. That's not a Sakai issue. And remember how I hate the polls tool. Well, we, I we fortunately we use Lime Survey as well. Uh, the people at my faculty have, uh, the tech people have installed a local version of that. It's an open source survey tool. And uh, for, the, for the complicated stuff, I use Lime Survey. So those are the 10 tools that I use to make my course a social environment, a social experience. And one of the obvious questions that arises at this point is, does it work? And of course, I suspect any teacher can cherry pick good things, but I'm going to anyway. So here's one. Um, I love when I love that. That's really cool when students tell can me that. that sorry, they, they, a student a student wrote, "This is the most interactive course I've taken." That's really cool. Um, I love that. This is part of the, the end of semester quiz that I give to the students. I don't grade it, but I read it and I respond to it. Um, I ask the students, what worked? What didn't work? What did you enjoy? Was the online learning experience what you expected? Um, 
So here are some other things that students have said. Um, they say they're very happy with the learning experience. I did appreciate the multiple platforms on which to engage. Um, another student wrote, this is the most interactive course I've taken. Um, I love when a student tells me that they got a job by applying what they learned in my course. Um, I appreciate the greatly detailed instructions. Remember when I was talking about the user experience and the clarity? That's the detailed instructions. Um, being able to engage and have actual interactions. Um, and that's, that's a really cool thing for me to hear. Um, and having students say that they enjoyed the course is a very cool thing, in spite of the fact that it is an online course. It is an asynchronous course, uh, which means we have very few of the advantages of, an, of a real life class where we can talk to each other to be able to still provide an interactive experience um, is something that I am very happy um, to try to do and very happy to report appears to work. So that's it. Um, I can send a PDF of the this content. Uh, there are lots of links there. I, yeah, I, I suspect that... Go ahead, please. I was going to say, I suspect it's also on the Open Imperio conference. Site. Yes, it is. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Yes. And I'm, I'm happy to go um, get the link and make it available to folks. Sure. Thank you. For that. Yes, you're welcome. So let me, let me ask you this. Uh, are all of you familiar with the Brian Chapman, these canonical numbers on time to develop e-learning? I am not. I don't know about others. Anybody? All right. Um, about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, a guy named Brian Chapman um, started, uh, he did a large scale, fairly large survey. I think it's just under 300 uh, organizations that develop and apply e-learning uh, across uh, hundreds of thousands of recipients. Uh, and he uh, developed this framework for assessing the amount of time it takes to develop one hour of finished content. Uh, if you're in the business of developing e-learning or um, helping others uh, facilitating it, uh, these are numbers that you probably are aware of, but it's nice to have an external validation for 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 the incredible amounts of time it takes to develop interactive or even static uh, learning uh, that is asynchronous. So there are a couple of other resources there, a couple of other links. And at this point, if anybody has any questions, uh, have at it. There was a question earlier from Terry Golightly. She wondered if you were advocating for constructing small student groups rather than a whole class interaction. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably say so. Uh, I think uh, I think it's a I think it's a great idea. I think it's hard to do. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, let me be let me be clear. The um, an e-learning uh, delivering this highly interactive um, delivering this highly interactive experience is incredibly time-consuming. Um, Excuse me for a moment. Excuse me for a sec. Delivering an e-learning experience is incredibly um, time-consuming. Uh, making it interactive is incredibly time-consuming. It's um, so when you break it into cohorts, small groups. I suspect, yeah. Uh, is have you done this? Terry, do you want to chime in? Uh, no, she's, she replies okay. that she has not, but was just okay. wondering. Um, I suspect it's a good idea. I haven't done it. Um, I, I will think on this. I'll, I'll, I'll try it uh, mm -hmm. to, see, to see how it works. I suspect, I mean, I'm not a big fan of group work. That's a problem, especially in a third or fourth year university class. <laughs> So, I so 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's uh, talk about asymmetrical. Uh, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's a great idea. And I think it, it might, it might help. It might help. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Michael, I was wondering, um, I see you got a lot of comments from students who were really happy with the course and got a lot out of it. Do you have any percentages of possible, you know, those students versus students who might have struggled with this type of delivery? Yeah, I, I don't have formal numbers on that. And of course, I, I picked nice comments, uh, right. but the the proportion of favorable to unfavorable is at least. I I might get two or three um, negative comments or critical comments. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, this is this is a voluntary thing. I don't grade students on this. They do it because they want to, and um, I usually do it after. They've submitted all of their work, so I don't think they're they're sucking up for grades. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I, every there there are always students who are not entirely happy. We at Western we conduct um, student student ass uh, assessments, and <laughs> of course nobody nobody likes to see the red part of the bar which indicates unhappiness versus the blue part of the bar i'd say that i run between uh 10 to 20 percent uh critical comments where students are not terribly happy that's mm -hmm. that's uh, i think that's that's probably where i am quite honestly yeah. it doesn't work for everybody e-learning e-learning does not work for everybody my tone doesn't work for everybody um the course content doesn't work for everybody um I, I had a principal who suggested you're gonna always gonna have thirty percent of your class that love you, thirty percent that hate you, and thirty percent that. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so it sounds like you're doing pretty well. Then. I'm. I, I believe me. I spend far more time fretting about the unhappy comments than I spend glowing about the happy ones. Right. I, I hear you. Yeah. I and sometimes they're right. I mean some. Some aspects of the course can be improved. Could I have more multimedia? Heck yes. Um, would I? Am I working in? Am I trying to figure out how to afford storyline so that I can start doing some some other uh, types of content? Absolutely. Um, Captivate just isn't doing it for me. I, I spent thirty days on Captivate and it just no. Oh, yeah. I, I struggle with that one too. Anybody have I, any I, questions for Michael? This has re really been eye-opening for me, and I can't wait to share this with other folks here at the University of Virginia. Anybody else have any comments or uh, questions for Michael? So none are coming up. Oh. Just thanking you for a great presentation oh, thank and you. sharing this with us. This is this has been super helpful for me personally, um, and I know people I want to share this with. Um, so I'm very excited. <laughs> well, th thank you so much again for inviting me. I was I'm just delighted to to do this. I uh, oh, oh, like applying for the Imperial Award itself. The the process yeah. of of doing it. Uh, forces introspection, forces me to look critically at what I do, um, be happy about the, the the good stuff, and try to do better at the not so good stuff. So, right. this is this has been an absolute yeah. delight. And uh, any questions, any follow ups, um, by all means, by all means, send them to me. Uh, right now, what I'm working on with at Western, I don't know how much success I'll get. Um, I'm hoping to actually develop a course for teachers. On for for educators for ed faculties of education on how to use this stuff because I think a lot of us are oh, wow. sort of thrown into the deep end, and um, we are asked to develop it as we you know sort of start to use the tool as if the pedagogy were the same. Um, right. So wow, that so, sounds fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, thank you so much, uh, Tricia, and uh, and everybody, uh, and um, congratulations yes. to you. On
on your award. Well deserved. Thank, thank you. you again. Yeah. All right. I'm All going right. to turn off that screen. There okay. we go. Okay. Thanks again. Thanks very much. Take care. You too, Michael. Thank you. So, folks, we're going to uh, wrap up with um, just touching base on future meeting topics. Uh, Matt Burgess here at UVA has agreed to present on to give an update on the site builder project that we are working on and uh, share with you some of the design uh, and workflow ideas for site creation uh, changes that we are making and plan to contribute back to the community. So looking forward to that uh, in our next meeting on September 5th. Uh, we have September 19th open and beyond. So we are definitely actively looking for presenters. If you have ideas or if you have something you want to present on, um, please reach out to me or Matt Burgess or Wilma and let us know uh, what topic um, is of interest to you and a date when you might be able to present it or if it's somebody you're recommending, some, give us their contact information so we can reach out. Any questions or other comments before we adjourn? All right, well, I thank you all for joining us today, and I hope you got as much out of Michael's presentation as I have, and uh, we'll see you on September 5th.